So, thanks very much. Um, I think it probably doesn't need much explanation why the petroleum industry matters to all of us, and particularly those with children or grandchildren uh, whose futures are, uh, as we now know, very, very much compromised. Um, I, my own interest is in social movements, so um, among those, the movements of the Niger Delta, uh, the uh, movement against Shell in Mayo and against fracking in the Irish Midlands, and the <coughs> question of what can we do uh, against um, some very determined and powerful interests. Now, last Wednesday, uh, a Brussels-based anti-fracking campaigner wrote, things have been quiet on the fracking front. Um, in Ireland, the Parliament has backed a bill calling for an outright ban, meaning it progresses to the next legislative stage. Sorry. And he goes on name-checking various countries, Poland, things are going well. Of course, we might be a little bit cynical about Doyle Aaron and, and its shenanigans. But then this Wednesday, Trump won the American election, and suddenly the outcome of the standoff at Standing Rock, and what seemed to be a victory of the Keystone XL pipeline, is back up in the air again. So you could say what a difference a week makes, but what I want to say is what a difference politics makes. Because the supporters of the petroleum industry uh, will tell you these are just technical decisions. This is just how it has to be. There is very little choice in it. Many opponents and many ordinary people are sort of shell-shocked into a state of grim despair. This is just what is coming. But when you look at it, uh, when you look in detail at Mayo, at the Niger Delta, indeed at these um, momentous decisions, you find that it's actually people pushing things and other people pushing back that determine what happens. You can see this very well in relation to tar sands, where in the years of the oil, the boom in oil prices between 2010 and 2013, producers managed to lose over 30 billion of which 55%, according to analysts, could credibly be related to resistance, primarily by First Nations groups in Canada who have been extremely effective uh, in this respect. And of course that can be true in positive ways, as with the Paris Agreement, or in negative ways, as with the third runway to throw. So if we want to think about the future of petroleum and you know, the future of sea levels and you know, other important things, we're talking about what people do. And this is, I think, very much in line with Ken Saroweda's legacy, uh, which is all about not accepting, but being part of the decision. So very briefly, I want to outline some reasons for hope. Uh, I think they're not often stressed enough. So since 2014, we've had a period of seriously low oil prices, partly uh, because OPEC has been very keen to shaft the tar sands industry, um, broadly speaking, but also to uh, make it unprofitable to develop some of the new oil and gas fields that can now technically be developed. For example, the mega deep fields under salt uh, off Brazil. These are at some, something like six to seven kilometers below the surface of the ocean. Yeah. We are in some cases talking literally about 2,000 meters of water, 2,000 meters of rock, 2,000 meters of salt, and then there's oil. It, extraordinary stuff. So when you make oil prices less, uh, you uh, remove the possibility of profitably exploiting that at least for now. Uh, in Ireland, this is part of why the fracking industry has not been doing so well. This is very good news uh, on the other side because it means local communities have some advance warning. And we know from Mayo, it takes people time to get their heads around what all of this means. It is not obvious immediately. It's extraordinarily complex stuff. Um, in fracking in general, which is one of the big issues in Europe, it is an advantage as well that very often we're dealing with relatively small firms. So a firm like Shell is very hard to defeat, and it's very hard for governments to say no to a firm like Shell. 
to say yes or no to the small firms that they're essentially speculative firms involved in fracking is much easier. It's a conscious political decision on the part of the British government to say yes to fracking, no to renewable energy. They're not forced to do it. Yeah? No doubt they have reasons why they're doing it, some of them sensible and strategic, if you like, in their own terms, some of them to do with money under the table, but it's a choice. Whereas the Irish government with Shell, um, we have to bear in mind that the, multi, uh, the big oil majors are bigger in terms of their economies than many, many states. Um, Graham's research I find really interesting because it tells us about the start of a historical tunnel, the start of a period in which this picture, what the oil industry wants they get, becomes absolutely common sense. And even opponents are, you know, uh, experts from abroad saying, you know, the remarkable thing was that the Rossport struggle lasted 15 years. No, it wasn't remarkable that they lost, it was remarkable that they kept going for so long. Um, but we are starting to see some light around that, not just with the Paris Agreement, but also with some of the oil companies themselves trying to divest, uh, and with it becoming rather clear that there are actually other economic interests which are seriously compromised by climate change. It starts to become, once again, a period of political choice. Is the future with oil or not? And this is really, really important. Um, and lastly, um, perhaps I should say, a significant proportion of the new projects are in areas with substantial indigenous populations. Uh, and this is very important because those populations have their backs to the wall, as in Ogomi land, for economic survival, for cultural survival, in a way that other groups do not necessarily have. Um, so it may, and they have fewer ties they are willing to resist more solidly. So it is not overall a bad period. Even with something like Rossport, um, there are victories for the industry and for petrol head states which are pretty pyrrhic. So they started out budgeting 800 million, it cost them something like 3.5 billion in the end, and 15 years. This is the kind of thing that happened with nuclear power programs in Europe in the 70s and the 80s. Once the state had committed to them, they were going to do them, but actually forcing them through cost them so much in political capital and sheer physical capital <coughs> that they stopped for decades. And the same with the British government's roads program. Once something became an issue of prestige, they were going to force it through, but then actually they couldn't politically or financially proceed. So I think this is important. Um, whether we win or not is, is a question of politics, and you can see that with the dark side, people like Trump, May, and Putin. But bizarrely, you can see some rather nasty characters like the Chinese government going, we have some sort of strategic interest in renewables. It's not given that bad people are necessarily petrol heads, which is good, because if we have to have a world full of good people, we will be waiting a very long time. Conversely, and I think this is the real uh, lesson from most often the Agrarian struggle, from Standing Rock, uh, we need to work together. Um, you can see this in Lancashire with allies between the rather wonderful Lancashire Nanas and Eco Warriors. You can see it in Norway with the churches and trade unions working together. Um, this is how we win things. Um, it is possible, it can be done, it's done in some places, uh, it can be done here, uh, and it's important to remember that we can at times win. Thank you.